and because it implied that you cannot square the circle. The squaring the circle a problem was open uh, for thousands of years since ancient Greece and so this. But this is not, even this is not too hard, but this is, uh, this. But this is relatively easy, and even this is not too hard nowadays. But nobody had any clue. Clue, sorry, nobody had any clue. I do have a clue. I'm sure that e plus pi is not irrational. Because why should it be? There are Aleph real numbers. And there are only Aleph zero rational numbers. If you take a random real number and do the probability, it's a very small zero. So it's, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Of course, it's possible to come up with two real numbers such so that you add them up, you get a rational number. For example, e plus 1 is irrational, 1 minus e is irrational. So, but here you have an obvious good reason why uh, this and this is rational. But here, e and pi are so far apart the definitions, so there's no reason to believe that a evil make it. Yet nobody has any clue how to give a rigorous proof or any proof for that matter, except this heuristic proof that has given you this extremely amazing. Ditto for e times pi. It's wide open. You'll be super famous. It's not even a million dollar problem. It's probably much harder. That's why it's been bad on. Uh, to prove that e times pi. To find what? To prove that e times pi. But it's an exercise uh, for you to prove that it's not possible for both of them to be rational. <laughs> so this is an exercise. At least one of them is rational. Also, big open problems about irrationality are the values of the zeta function that I already mentioned in integer. But so the so-called zeta 2 has a nice formula in terms of pi. It goes back to Euler. And since pi is transcendental, we know that this is not a rational number. And similarly, zeta of 2m is also times some Bernoulli numbers. I don't know. So also, it's well known and was known since Euler that these are not rational. But what about zeta 3? There's no nice formula in terms of pi or any known constants for zeta of 3. Of course, you can compute it on a computer. You have an infinite series. You can compute any decimal points, although it's very slow convergent. Uh, and nobody knew since Euler how to prove that this is ir irrational. Of course, once again, by heuristic reasons, it must have been irrational. There's no good reason why it should be rational. Uh, but, but it's a beautiful story. In 1977, Roger Aperi, who at the time was 62 year old, and it's not like he had a great track record. He was somebody who was only teaching for many years. Uh, was already had tenure. In, in France, you have tenure early and there's no pressure to publish. So he just thought about this problem for 30 years and didn't publish anything. And then one day he found an amazing proof that this is irrational. But this is just the tip of an iceberg. Zeta that a five? Forget it. Nobody has any clue. It's still wide open. Or for that matter, any zeta of an odd. So these are extremely hard problems uh, to us today that nobody. Uh, so I recommend that we do it. And uh, the other problems too.
that I have, and let me tell you, my own field is enumeration. And what's nice about enumeration is that you can extend it to a child. Doesn't mean that it's easy. So one area in which you have lots of open problems is pattern avoidance. Interpretation. You're welcome to go to Wikipedia and look for pattern, 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 sorry, pattern avoidance. So of course you know the n factorial permutations altogether. For dynamic first, for example. By the way, Brian is an expert on pattern avoidance. Now here you have okay, let's make a bigger one. If you have an occurrence of uh, ABC of this one, this is called an ABC pattern or one ABC. So this has a pattern ABC. So you look at sub sequences of length three, and in this case, it has ABC. So it's a well-known theorem that the number of permutations of length n avoiding the pattern 1 to 3 or ABC is given by beautiful explicit formula, the famous Catalan numbers. So, and similarly, avoiding the pattern 1, 3, 2. And each of them imply trivially 3 to 1. So for patterns of next 3, it's easy and well known. Not trivial, but classical and easy. But now, what about patterns of length 4? The number of permutations of length n that avoid the pattern. 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D. In other words, in how many ways can you arrange n people of n different heights so that you never have the, this pattern? So if you look at all the anxious four choices of taking A, B, C, and D, you never have the shortest guy being here, the second shortest here, and the third, and that's the tallest. How many are they? This is much harder. And in 1990, a mathematician, very smart one, I am a guesser, proved it. Found a, a formula. A nice, not so nice, but a formula. In 1998, now what about the pattern? So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now for 1, 3, 4, 2, another very smart mathematician, Miklos Bonner, in 1997, found an explicit formula, not so nice, uh, but an explicit, and you can compute with it very fast, uh, for uh, the pattern uh, 1, 3, 4, 2. In other words, the number of permutations of length n, such that you cannot find uh, the pattern A, C, D, B. So if you look at all the places, you never ever have the occurrence of the pattern A, A is the smallest. So the smallest being here, the second smaller being here, the third smallest being here. How many are there? It's a natural problem. And there is a nice formula. But nobody, it's a wide, wide open and make you semi-famous in the community, you want and make you super famous because it's only one field called enumeration. It's wide unknown. And the only known algorithms are exponential. So by this, you can easily compute the first 200 or even 1,000 terms of these sequences. This people only know up to 25 or 30. So that's another. Big open problem, I'll be very proud of you if you solve this. So it tells you 
these easily stated problems, and who knows, maybe you can prove it. Another class of amazingly easy to state problems come from Ramsey theory. And it's amazing, we should be really humble. We always pride ourselves. We do this, we do that, we prove these conjectures. So all these open problems that have been proved are nothing compared to those problems that are still open and are so easy to state. So once again, you have a party with n people who either love each other or hate each other. So you want to invite n people to a party. And, but you want to uh, color the edges. So make them love or hate each other. So the question is, uh, what is the smallest number of people So you don't know beforehand, sorry, you don't know beforehand whether the lab is as or why is You make a party and you want to guarantee it such that you are guaranteed that every coloring of the edges and for any relationship. So you have n people, you have n choose two relationships. Every two people is a love is other or hate each other. So you have two to the power n choose two possible uh, relationships, uh, scenarios. You want to invite the people and you don't want to have a clicks. You don't like clicks. You don't want to see people who love each other, who will just ignore everybody else, and you don't want to see people who hate each other, who will mutually uh, hate each other. You want to be more balanced. So the Ramsey number of n is the smallest number of people n such that any possible relationship, or in class theory terms, every coloring of the edges, you guaranteed to either have uh, three people who love each other uh, and three people who hate each other. Now for three, it's an easy exercise. Not easy, it's a hard exercise for kids. So I will say for six. So it's a nice brain teaser if you have six people and uh, any choice of possibilities, so you have, of course, nowadays you can put it on a computer and uh, look at each of them, and you're guaranteed to have either three people who love each other, it's called a clique, or three people who hate each other. Now, the analogous problem for four are for four. Also, it's known, it's 18, I think. It's due to Gleason and his collaborator. But this conceptually trivial problem, nobody knows. So it's just a numeric conceptual problem. You can write easily a computer program. It's known that it's between 45 and 49. So example 49, big deal. Look at all the 49 choose 2 uh, edges and look at all these graphs. For each and every one of them, see whether uh, you look at all the five collections of five people, whether you find and you guaranteed to have it so you can have a computer search. Unfortunately, no computer in the world is big enough to do it like this. And, uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, uh, McKay and Radiowski, I think, uh, did another thing. 
four people who love each other or five people who hate each other or vice versa. So that's how little we know. So even for this conceptually, trivial, numerically, it's such a big thing. And in my humble opinion, this is much deeper problem than the human hypothesis. Most mathematicians look down on specific things that your model or finite amount of computation. But the depth of this result, the exact value of R66, in my opinion, is much more interesting and significant in the eyes of God than the Riemann hypothesis, uh, or P versus NP. And there's an anecdote about Erdos, uh, who said that if some alien race would have asked us what is R5, R5 or 5, or R5, we should do our best uh, to, uh, to find it. And everybody should work for There is some glimmer of hope, not much. But if the aliens would have asked us about R66, we should give up and try to kill them the other ways, <laughs> but not to try. <laughs> and it's still true uh, today. And uh, maybe with bigger computers, with random computers, who knows? Uh, but. but so for those pure mathematicians, who saying that all numerical specific problems are trivial, here is a challenge that nobody has any clue. And I know quite a few field scientists try very hard to prove it. But of course, you don't publish what you didn't prove. You only publish what you prove. Only by private communication, you know. <laughs> so if you know that a great smart guy tried very hard to prove a conjecture and say, you know, it's probably very hard. But then again, maybe you have an idea that he or she did not have. So it's not too hard to prove that R of n is definitely equal to 4 to the power n. In fact, it's slightly, slightly better. Uh, 2n should n. No, 4n. Uh, what is it? 6 to 3, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah to an or arc here, yeah. Yeah. And this is. And never mind, for the. And what's also known roughly up to some correcting terms. Nobody, and if people believe it's closer to the proper end, but nobody can prove it. So you'd be super, super famous if you can find a constant not dependent on n, such that the Ramsey number, the smallest size of the party, eh, such that n people, you guarantee to find n people who love each other or n people who hate each other, is 3.999. Nobody has any clue how to prove this. This is probably also far from the truth. So, good luck. And finally, let me conclude with my favorite open problem that I was dreaming to prove. And now I tend to believe that it is false. So now I have my hopes that it may be false. This is my absolute favorite. It's called the Jacobian conjecture. And once again, it's very easy to state. And nobody has any clue how to prove it. And if any of you can prove it, let me know. The very part of you. But please tell everybody that I told you about it the first time. Let's look at the function, a polynomial in one variable. For example, a plus bx plus cx squared. So it's a mapping from the real line to the real line. Question, can you go back? Of course, you can solve the quadratic equation, and you can get an inverse mapping. There are two of them, but you have an inverse mapping to the quadratic equation. But it's not a polynomial. Question, under what conditions is a polynomial mapping from R1 to R1? The inverse is also a polynomial. Of course, if it's a linear expression, is a fine linear expression. Of course you can invert y plus ax plus b. 
So x equals y minus a over b. So if it's degree 1, then the inverse mapping is also polynomial. It's also easy at the side that it's if and only if. If you have two polynomials, and if you compose them, you get the identity mapping, then let's take the derivative of both sides and use the chain rule. So you have f prime of gx times g prime of x equals 1. Now, f and g are both polynomials. Uh, f, uh, no, we don't know that. Uh, we know the f is polynomial. Yeah, so both f and g, sorry. So both f and g are both polynomials. So they are the polynomial, and then the polynomial. A product of two polynomials is a polynomial, and the degree is added up. So see, the degree of this polynomial in x is 0, and the degree of this, the degree of this is 0. This must have degree 0, and this must have degree 0. So g prime of x must be degree 0. So g of x is a linear mapping. And ditto f prime. So we have the necessary and sufficient condition for a polynomial map from R1 to R1 to be uh, in inverse of each other is that f prime of x is identically a constant. Of course, not zero constant. Now, let's do the analogous things for R2. You have a polynomial transformation from R2 to R2, or if you want C2 to C2, it doesn't matter. Or any, any field. No, C2 to C2. OK, a complex is the same. So now you have a mapping x, y goes to, so that's the input, p1 of x, y, p2 of x, y. By the implicit function theorem, blah, 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 there is an inverse transformation. Question, find necessary and sufficient conditions for the inverse transformation to also be polynomial. You input a polynomial transformation, and you want to find conditions that the inverse transformation is also polynomial. So once again, one direction, the analogous goes. So we have a P composed with Q is the identity mapping. The analog of the position that the Jacobian. And we have Jacobian of F of capital P at Q times the common of Q is the coven of the identity mapping, which is 1. So one direction is trivial. If the, uh, if the Jacobian and the, the other one is wide open, that's called the Jacobian conjecture. And it's even open for two dimensions. So the Jacobian thinks that if The, the carbon determinant of a polynomial transformation B is identically a constant, is it one zero? Yes, sorry, so one direction is if there is a polynomial if there is a polynomial inverse, then the decobian must be a non-zero constant. But the decobian conjecture due to Keller from the 1942 claims that if the Jacobian conjecture, if, sorry, if the Jacobian of the transformation is a non-zero constant, then the inverse, there exists the inverse transformation that we know for sure exists, but not uh, by the implicit function theorem, by the inverse function theorem, is also polynomial. 